I've done a lot of situation specific builds on this channel, ranging from an upgradable $200 gaming PC all the way to a $700 4K gaming PC. And while those are fun to do, the majority of people look for an all around balanced computer when deciding to build a new gaming PC, and so that's exactly what I'll be doing today. I present to you an $800 gaming PC that isn't too GPU or CPU oriented and focuses on having all around balanced parts. And oh yeah, it's 2023. We can't build a PC without including RGB. Before we get into the parts, I want to talk about my overall goal for this system. Like I said, I wanted to focus on a balanced system. That means not having a weak CPU that will bottleneck our experience at 1080p and not ignoring our storage speeds and ensuring that our PC stays nice and cool in the process. I did slightly favor the processor in this build, but it's better to have more for any content creation or streaming you may do. With that being said, let's get into our PC parts. Starting off with the core of our system, this B660 motherboard from ASRock will house everything. This is an exceptional board for the money coming with it. Two M.2 slots, two PCIe X16 slots, and support for Intel's 12th and 13th generation of processors. I will be leaving the B760 variant of this motherboard in the description below because we'll be using the i5-13400F, and if you don't have a spare 12th gen CPU like I did, you could run into some problems. Like I said, we'll be using Intel's i5-13400. This is the 6-core budget-friendly option from Intel that is not only good for gaming, but will allow you to do some light workstation-related tasks as well due to its included e-cores. I include this part over an i5 12400F because I want to be able to do some streaming and video editing with this machine. The faster P cores and additional E cores will definitely assist in doing so. Plus, if I wanted to upgrade to something like an RX 6800 XT later on, then this CPU will support it. After slotting this processor into the motherboard and adding the included stock cooler, we can move on to the memory we'll be adding. And that memory happens to be this 16GB kit from Team Group. This is DDR4 RAM, so we aren't getting next gen DDR5 speeds, not that our motherboard supports it, but it will be plenty enough for our gaming needs. This kit comes clocked at 3000 megahertz and has included addressable RGB, so it will fit our theme nicely. We will be running them in dual channel mode simply by putting them in opposing memory channels like so. So I didn't cheap out on storage this time around. I wanted something fast to support our video editing needs, although I did sacrifice space in doing so. I picked out this 500 gigabyte Samsung 970 EVO Plus Gen 3 drive for our boot and gaming needs. Yeah, it's only 500 gigabytes, but it's a great base for storage speeds and considering this motherboard supports two M.2 SSDs, you'll be able to upgrade later when you run into issues. As for this one, I definitely suggest putting it under the included SSD heatsink just to keep things nice and cool. Next up is this sweet MATX case from Vetro. This is the Vetro M01 compact PC case. This is one of my favorite micro ATX cases due to its looks and ease of building. It also comes with a great cooling solution, that being the included 200 millimeter fan mounted at the front. After slotting in the motherboard into our fully white case, we can move on to the power supply. While it seems like every graphics card these days needs a 600 watt plus power supply to support its power hungry needs. The one I've selected only requires a 500 watt one, and so that's what I've opted for. This EVGA 500 watt 80 plus bronze certified power supply is a great budget option for someone who is building a cheaper PC. Yeah, it has captured mustard cables, but considering how much it costs, I'd say it's 100% worth it. Plus, it kind of fits our RGB lighting. Okay, not really, but one can dream. Putting this PSU into our case and doing some quick cable management will make our system ready for the powerhouse behind the build, the graphics card. Though I could have gone to the used market to pick up something like a 1080 Ti, I wanted a card that was more modern and has ray tracing support. That card I'm looking to is the RX 6650 XT from AMD. This is a great card for the money, especially when gaming at 1080p. It will also allow us to do some 1440p gaming if we desire to do so, but just don't go crazy with it. Another reason I picked this out was its power requirements, like I previously stated, you only need 500 watts. With the quick installation of our graphics card, the entire build is fine and complete. I tried my best with this case to cable manage the ugly cables, and I think I did a pretty good job. Also, something worth mentioning is the addition of three RGB fans from Asia Horse, which only cost me around $30 and was a nice addition to cooling and aesthetic. Now, I could sit here and admire this thing all day, but I have a feeling most of you came here for this next part, the benchmarks. I'm going to skip over my normal CPU benchmarks today. If you want to learn more about the i5-13400F, click the video card up above. Instead, at the end of my gaming test, I will have a streaming benchmark test. But before that, I have eight games lined up that should show a wide variety of performance. Starting off, we have the tried and true CSGO. This is obviously to test our CPU single core performance, and I'd say it did pretty well. We saw an average of 473 FPS at 1080p high settings. This is pretty incredible, considering you'll be able to push a 360Hz monitor with this setup. Apex Legends is our other esport game that I like to test, and we see pretty modest performance. With an average of 
177 FPS and our 1% lows at 138, I'd say that this was more than a playable experience and definitely for those of you trying to get a competitive advantage. In our last competitive game, Halo Infinite, on ultra settings can make any system lag behind, but our build today managed to run it really well. An average of over 100 FPS means that if you'd like to be competitive and turn up the settings just to make everything look nice, you can do so pretty easy. In Doom Eternal, we see this computer shred it even at Ultra Nightmare settings. It was no surprise seeing an average of 238 FPS because of how optimized Doom is and how powerful our machine is. Starting the rounds of our harder to run games, we see it managed to maintain over 60 frames at all times while playing Forza Horizon 5 on extreme settings. This is no easy feat and goes to show just how much budget hardware has improved. Next up, I tested Spider-Man Miles Morales at very high settings and to my surprise, we got over 100 FPS on average. While we did see some dips down to 60-ish frames here and there, overall it was a very smooth experience and definitely worth the investment. One of the hardest things to run on my benchmarking list is Red Dead Redemption 2 at max settings. While this did push our system to the limit, we did get an average of around 76 FPS. I wouldn't expect to run this game at any higher resolution and still maintain that 60 FPS sweet spot, at least not at max settings. In our last game, I decided to run two tests. Cyberpunk is notorious for being one of the hardest games to run so I want to see a worst case scenario. With the settings cranked up, to Ultra, with no ray tracing enabled, we managed a staggering 77 FPS on average. Not to mention our 1% lows didn't even fall below 60. While that is impressive, turning on ray tracing to medium preset reveals that our AMD card was a huge bottleneck. To be honest though, the difference between ray tracing on and off is very minor, and in most cases, isn't worth turning on even for higher end systems. So for our last test, I wanted to see if we could put those extra e cores to work. And so I booted up OBS and set my streaming settings to 1920 by 1080 FPS while running at 6,000 kilobytes per second, only utilizing the software X264 and our encoding preset set to very fast. After setting the affinity to only use the E cores, we saw a great experience. We managed to maintain similar performance in Cyberpunk without causing stuttering in game, and our stream still looked great and had no dropped frames. If you're a streamer or even just record footage for fun, I would definitely recommend buying a few more cores in your processor to fully optimize your quality and frames. So there it is, guys, the best 1080p gaming PC money can buy in 2023 as of right now. While the system may be a bit more expensive for the resolution, investing in something like this will ensure you won't have to upgrade random parts in the near future and will allow you to explore other avenues on your PC besides gaming. The only real suggestion I would make is investing in a hard drive to store any long-term data or larger games. You can pick up this 4TB one from Seagate if you're looking to do so. I highly recommend it and even run it in my home NAS. It's nice to see this much power and aesthetics in this budget and build and makes me look forward to what the used market will be in a year or so. That's it for this video. Check out this $700 gaming beast if you like weird PC builds.